Well, welcome everyone to our program tonight. Um, on behalf of the Bridgman Public Library, um, we welcome you. We appreciate um, your, your willingness to venture out into this brave new world. And as we get increasingly used to it, it's, I guess we don't have to be as brave, but, but we appreciate um, yeah, your, your willingness to explore this format with us. Um, so just know that um, you will all, that everyone will be muted to begin with. And so um, we'll let our, our um, presenter do her thing and then there will be an opportunity for question and answer afterwards, at which time I will unmute folks. Um, so that's the, that's the plan as we know it. Um, so our our presenter tonight is Karen Dion. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Karen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Karen Dion, um, the author of The Marsh King's Daughter and Wait, The Wicked Sister, um, both award-winning and best-selling novels. Um, she's with us tonight to talk about her 20-year journey to becoming a best-selling author. So since you're here to hear her and not me, and with no further ado, I will turn it over to Karen. And Karen, we're so glad you're joining us tonight. We're, we're so appreciative of many folks. I've heard from many folks who have read your books who are really excited about your being here tonight. And uh, so, so welcome. Well, thank you. That's fantastic. And um, I, before I start in my actual presentation, whenever I talked, did a library presentation in person, I always just wanted to take a minute or two to tell people how important libraries are to me. Dennis and I were chatting about that, and I, some of you probably, you know, heard heard part of that. But I have a personal experience that I, I love to share. So as you'll find out later in my presentation, um, my husband and I lived in Michigan's Upper Peninsula for 30 years, and we raised our family there. And so we had four children. And if our children were going to develop a love of reading, libraries were everything. Um, we couldn't afford to buy books for them. If there had been a bookstore, we could, we could go to. So, you know, the library was just everything. Mm -hmm. So when we, my son, my son was five years old when we moved from Newberry to St. Ignace. And my son at five loved dinosaurs. And I know every five-year-old boy loves dinosaurs, but my son loved dinosaurs massively. And so um, what happened was the, the librarian picked up on that. So when she was getting ready to order new books for the library, she would ask Daniel, show him the catalog and let him pick, which mm. I thought was just so amazing and kind. So I, I'm quite certain that uh, St. Ignace has like the biggest collection of dinosaur books in the entire <laughs> Upper Peninsula in their, in their children's section. But it didn't stop there. So somehow Daniel, at again, little five-year-old boy, he got the idea that if he checked out his favorite dinosaur book 20 times, he could keep it. <laughs> we know that's not how libraries work, right? <laughs> but that's the idea. Story, uh, he never got the book, obviously. But <laughs> fast forward many, many years, and the library digitized their collection. The librarian saved the card from that book. Oh, look at that. And I don't know how well you can see it, but mm -hmm. if you can, can see, see it clearly, you can see our family number 1262, 1262, 1262, 1262, all down here from um, June of 89 to November of 99. So for 10 years, he worked to try to collect that book. But I just think it's so amazing, you know, that the librarian saved this for me. So yeah, you know, that's lovely. Yay. And, and thank you for librarians and all you do for the community, big and small. It means just means the world. That's great. Thank you. You're most welcome. So uh, I'm going to start my screen share. And um, yeah, this presentation is called my 20 year journey to best selling author, but I promise it's not a lengthy presentation because I like to leave a lot of room for questions and answers at the end. So I might go a little fast through that, but you, you can always come back and ask a question at the end. Um, so 
screen share and there it is. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is my 20 year journey to best-selling author. Uh, briefly, my writing history, um, I have these two, my, I was first published in 2008 and then again in 2011, 2014, my early novels, Freezing Point and Boiling Point were science-based thrillers, similar to what Michael Crichton writes. And I started writing that kind of book because that's what I like to read. So why not? Um, these books published with Berkeley. So that was with a major publisher. And when they, when they came out in um, mass market paperback, you know, the little size, they, um, they were in, available in grocery stores and drug stores, Myers, CVS, pharmacy, you know, Borders. We still had Borders bookstores. So it was incredibly exciting. And then my next novel after that was um, a television tie-in novel that uh, is based on the TV show, The Killing. It's my original story using the characters from the show, you know, an authorized version sort of thing, not fan fiction. And that might sound glamorous, but it's what's called work for hire. So that means um, I, you know, I was paid a, a flat fee to write the book, a very small amount, actually, the least I, in my mind, I thought I would ever take for writing a novel. And I don't own the copyright to, to the story. So um, while this was exciting, it, it wasn't exactly, you know, blow people out of the water sort of success. At the same time, I also got involved with writers online because I was living in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I didn't know any writers in person. Um, that kind of grew into a discussion uh, forum called Backspace. And then the forum grew into conferences in New York. And I deliberately made this screen kind of a jumble because I was involved in a lot of different things. Um, at the end, we were also invited or asked by the owner of a private island in the Bahamas if I and my business partner would organize and run a week long retreat for writers on her island. And we're like, hmm, let me think about that. Okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so while I was doing this, I wasn't getting much writing done. And because my career wasn't really going anywhere, there were a lot of times that I thought, oh, maybe that's, uh, that's as good as it's gonna get. And maybe instead of writing, I should just conference concentrate on conference organizing because that was so so successful and also satisfying to help other people reach their publishing goals but in the lead up to my 2013 backspace writers conference in new york i happened to notice that a writer who had gotten her literary agent at one of my previous conferences was coming out with her subsequent book and i hadn't written anything and it just hit me and i thought ah oh, you know I'm not done. I haven't reached my publishing goals. And so what happened was I had gotten so involved with, with everything around the business of writing. I was also on the board of directors of the International Thriller Writers. And I, I was managing editor of the International Thriller Writers um, monthly magazine. It's just I was doing all kinds of things, but I wasn't writing. So I dialed back those extra activities. And it wasn't too much longer after that that I got the idea for The Marsh King's Daughter. And for those who don't know the story or who haven't read it very briefly, The Marsh King's Daughter is a story of a young woman who um, she lives for the first 12 years of her life with her mother and father in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by marsh or swamp in the Tequamen and River Valley in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And during all that time, she never sees another human being except her mother and father, which might sound grim, but she loves her life. For, for one thing, it's the only thing she knows, but she also is like a little tomboy. She loves hunting and fishing and foraging. She finds out at the age of 12, however, the reason they live like that is because her father kidnapped her mother and she was the product of that crime. That's half the story. In the present day part of the story, she's a young mother of two little girls living south of Grand Marais. Her husband doesn't know her history because she's put all reinvented herself with a new name and a new look and just put all that notoriety behind her when she and her mother came out of the marsh. Her father escapes from the maximum security prison near Marquette, disappears into the Sydney Wildlife Refuge, the swamp, the marsh, and um, Helena knows that he's coming for her. So she has to use the hunting and tracking skills that he taught her as a little girl to find him before he can find her. Well, this novel was life-changing for me. It, it um, 
it sold at auction. What that means is, so when my, my agent sent the manuscript in uh, May of 2016 around to editors to see if anyone wanted to publish it, it ended up um, 12 publishers wanted to publish it. <laughs> so we had a 12-way bidding war. <laughs> and so that was pretty exciting. And that was just for in the United States. Immediately after, we had uh, a, a seven-way auction in the UK, a five-way auction in Germany, a three-way auction in Korea. The Marsh King's Daughter sold for a record amount in Poland. Altogether, we sold translation rights in 25 countries, if you can believe that. Um, I'm going to, uh, I jumped ahead a little bit. So, so this is a little bit about why I set the book in the Upper Peninsula. This is a little bit of my background. Um, I'll come back to that, how well the Marsh King's daughter did in a second. So what happened was when I got the idea for the Marsh King's daughter, I actually woke up in the night with the first sentences fully formed in my head. And this is where the character, um, she's introducing herself to the reader she's, uh, uh, and, and how this is where she grew up. Well, I almost, when I started writing the book seriously, I almost gave the book an urban setting because um, I was thinking about the young women in Cleveland who were hidden away in plain sight for so long in, in the city. And I thought, well, how does this happen? But at the last minute, I set the book where I did in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by a marsh right here in the Tequamina River Valley. And the reason I set it there is because, um, as I've mentioned, I lived in the Upper Peninsula beginning in the 1970s when my husband and I homesteaded there as a young married couple. So this was 1974. We bought 10 acres. Uh, we lived in that little tent in this picture while we built our cabin. Our daughter was six weeks old when we moved there and we carried water from a stream and we sampled wild foods. So any of you who've read The Marsh King's Daughter, you can probably see that I drew very heavily on these experiences and my firsthand knowledge when I wrote the book. Um, this is our daughter. Uh, I know she looks a little worried in that picture, but I, I promise she had a good time. <laughs> she was a little, a little wilderness baby. And this is us, you know, doing our uh, American Gothic pose, right? <laughs> Why my husband is holding a can of motor oil, I don't know, but you know, we were we were kind of crazy. Um, that's what the cabin looked like at the end of the first winter, and this is what it looked like when we were finished with it inside. And I, you know, I'm kind of proud of that because I look at myself in that photo. I'm 22 years old, and I I think wow, you know, this cabin didn't exist. And, and then we built this, this place ourselves. So, you know, that's pretty neat. And <clears throat> people have wondered if the cabin is still there. This is what it looks like today. We're right on, we built right on M28. So if you've gone across between Sini and McMillan or Newberry and Marquette on M28, you, you've passed by my cabin. They Put a second story on and an addition behind but here's a little bit of the original stonework in that window that we were standing in front of this was so cool because a year ago i was doing some events in the up and i know the the woman who lives in this house and she was home so i stopped with my daughter and um uh she had us come in for a cup of tea so even though the house was all changed i was sitting in that in that space that my husband and i made all those years ago and it was just really really cool to to do that so as you might imagine there were a lot of times when i was writing the marsh king's daughter that for me it almost felt like i was writing a memoir because you know i was drawing a lot on personal experience and um you know my knowledge of the area that uh, i just there were a lot of times when I would include a detail and I would think to myself, I, I never would have found that no matter how much I researched online because I, I just knew these things from living in the Upper Peninsula for so long. So now back to the, <coughs> excuse me, how, how well the Marsh King's Daughter did and how it's, it sold into so many languages. These are some of the covers, which isn't, isn't that fun to look at? Um, uh, I, I particularly like the Russian cover. It, it looks so dark and mysterious. And then some of them, like the Spanish and the Portuguese cover, um, that's not a UP swamp and a, you know, a man standing in a boat pulling it. That's not what you would see in the Upper Peninsula, obviously. 
but it's what Spanish readers would think of, you know, with a marsh or a swamp. So as you can see, the publisher has the right to change the cover, even to change the title, because not all of these say the Marsh King's Daughter, if you're familiar with any of these languages, it's because they know their audience best and they know what, what will appeal to their readers. So once the Marsh King's Daughter of the book started being published in other countries, boy, did it get exciting because people would send me pictures from around the world. So this is in the Netherlands. My Dutch publisher apparently bought the, this billboard space on street corners and, and so forth uh, for the book. Um, this is a picture someone sent me from Poland. I'm pretty sure it's a truck stop because that looks like a map on the side. And um, <coughs> excuse me, that looks like the audio book, you know, size. And while I don't read Polish, I'm pretty sure I know what bestseller means. So, you know, that was pretty cool. And then a friend of mine was walking down. Um, she was in Barcelona, Spain, and she happened to pass Spain's biggest bookstore. And she saw this, <laughs> which that Windows display just makes my jaw drop to this day. Uh, I don't know how you get a poster that big. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's taller than I am. And, you know, all these books for sale on the inside. And then, you know, the most, I, I would say the most outstanding display that I saw came from Sweden. When The Marsh King's Daughter was published in paperback there, it was chosen to be like a book of the month selection for their biggest chain of stores. And I guess this chain of stores is all the way from um, big box stores like our Sam's Club and Costco down to little mom and pop stores. And so the price is reduced. It's the, it's the book of the month. So these are the pictures that people sent me from Sweden. And again, you know, the, especially the photo on, on my left there, all those copies of the book, the giant poster, it's, it's like, you know, anybody walking in the bookstore, hmm, what book shall I buy? Maybe this one? <laughs> it's like the other books didn't even have a chance, right? <laughs> and then the other picture amuses me too, because, you know, that does look like a, a Sam's Club or a Costco. And, you know, of course, as someone is shopping for pajamas and whatever is in those bins over there, they're going to want to buy a copy of my novel, right? <laughs> so unsurprisingly, with that kind of exposure, um, the Marsh King's Daughter did hit number one in, uh, on the paperback bestseller list in Sweden. So that's how I can say I'm a number one internationally bestselling author. Still blows my mind. Um, the Marsh King's Daughter was also a bestseller in Germany and in Iceland. That's it down there at the bottom. Uh, don't ask me to pronounce it. Oh. <laughs> And then I also had a lot of fun because my UK publisher brought me over to England to do some signings and promotion for the book there. And my Norwegian publisher brought me over as well, which was super cool. Um, this was early March when I was there. And um, my, my kids, they wanted to know, you know, what's Norway like? And I, I said, it's like the UP on steroids. <laughs> you know, it was just so magnificent. I, I really felt at home there. And besides selling well, you know, there's two halves to a book success. We all know bestsellers can be a bestseller and they're not particularly well-written, right? But for whatever reason, they have an appeal to, to people and it sells a lot of copies. Well, The Marsh King's Daughter got a lot of recognition for the quality of the book. And as a writer, that really means a lot to me. So, you know, it was a Michigan notable book. It won these couple of awards in the, in the thriller writing world. And it was named a best book of 2017 by iBooks and, and Shelf Awareness and so many reviewers. And so, yeah, that was really gratifying to me because, you know, it spoke to the writing, to the, to the quality of the book. And The Marsh King's Daughter was reviewed in the New York Times, which was like a kill me now moment. It can't get any better than this because it was a rave review. There wasn't a, a sour note in it anywhere. Um, yeah, so that was, that was a, another amazing thing. And you would think at this point, it can't get any better, right? I'm talking about what happened over the course of about a year. And it was just like, boom, 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 all these exciting things. But there's one more thing. <laughs> Um, the Marsh King's Daughter has been optioned for a major motion picture. Thank you. I see Dennis clapping. If I could see everybody, I'm sure the others are too. Thanks. It's pretty darn exciting. So 
as you can see, the people who are involved, the producers who are involved in this project are responsible for some really excellent films. Um, the Revenant and The Imitation Game with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, screenwriter for The Revenant is the one who adapted my novel um, for the screen. And while it's been two years, you know, these things kind of drag along. My literary agent, you know, when, when they first optioned the film, he said, now don't get excited. You know, Hollywood is very volatile, very changeable, you know, and, and, um, I told him too late, <laughs> I'm excited. So, but he's right because in that two years time, we've had um, four directors for the movie and three actresses, okay, attached to play the role of Helena. Um, but, and, and like I say, COVID slowed things down a little bit, obviously, as it did for almost everything. But we've had some movement recently and I'm pretty excited about it. I was told that the uh, director that we had um, is off the project, not because he does not want to direct it anymore, but because he's working on another project that's going to take about a year to a year and a half and the producers don't wanna wait that long. And I was like, ooh, that sounds promising, right? <laughs> And we just got a new star uh, who is attached to play the role of Helena. I can't tell you who she is. And it makes me so sad that I can't do that because you would recognize her name in an instant. And it's so exciting. But this is not my news to share. You know, the, the producers, the director, when the time is right, they'll make a big splashy announcement about it. So hopefully, you know, we won't have too much longer to wait. I will just say this. Um, as an author, it just astonishes me to think that people of, of this level of talent and ability and, and experience in the industry, that they want, they chose my book to bring to the screen. You know, it's like, there's, there's so many scripts, there's so many screenplays, there's so many books. A lot of books get optioned and never get made. And, you know, we're still obviously waiting for the, the film to be greenlit. But um, yeah, it's just, again, it's really gratifying as an author to think that I could, I could write a story that captures people's attention like that. And so now on to The Wicked Sister, because when The Marsh King's Daughter sold to G.P. Putnam's Sons in uh, May of 2016, I, I signed a contract for two books, even though I had no idea what the next book was going to be. I figured, oh, I can come up with an idea. <laughs> the idea was the easy part. The writing was a little challenging. And I will say th this, <coughs> excuse me, I have to take a little sip. There's, there's a three year gap between the two novels as some may have noticed. And the thing is for all those exciting things that happened for the Marsh King's daughter as a, as a writer creatively, it was a little crushing because, you know, always in my head was, um, I've got to do this again. I've, I've, my next book's got to be as good. It's got to be better, you know, and I was always comparing the two books in my head. And, you know, it was, it was difficult. It was challenging to, to write that second book with that, the weight of that success <laughs> as if that's a problem, but, you know, creatively it was. So what, what helped me to finally break through that was realizing that it's, it wasn't my job to compare the two novels. Inevitably, reviewers and readers would do that. My job was to make The Wicked Sister the best version of itself that it could be. And then, so that's what I did. And, you know, things, things went on from there. Um, the Wicked Sister was recently chosen by Publishers Weekly as one of their best thrillers of the year, which, you know, again, just astounds me. And um, I don't have it in my presentation here, but uh, The Wicked Sister is, uh, it's now been three weeks on the bestseller list in Germany. Yay. <laughs> so, you know, the, the Marsh King's Daughter tells the story of Helena. The Wicked Sister tells the story of Rachel. So I like to say Rachel is following in her big sister's footsteps, you know, so that makes that makes me very happy. <laughs> and so I thought I would just briefly before I wrap up, talk a little bit about my inspiration for the Wicked Sister. I'm going to assume some of you have read it, some of you have not. Um, the Wicked Sister, just briefly for those who have not read it, it tells the story of a young woman 
who um for the well as the story opens well let me see how can i do this okay <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm out of practice the wicked sister is about a young woman who grows up in a beautiful log cabin so the opposite of helena helena's cabin is like this rundown shack this is a beautiful log cabin on four thousand acres of pristine wilderness southwest of or southeast of marquette so still in the upper peninsula this acreage has been in the family for generations it's never been logged it's pristine wilderness the cabin is is you can hardly use that word it's a hunting lodge story copper roof stained glass windows tiffany lamps just everything is really beautiful rachel's parents are wildlife biologists and so her father studies the amphibians on the property and her mother studies black bears Rachel grows up with feeling such a strong connection to the land and to the natural world that at a very early age, she becomes a vegetarian and she won't even kill a mosquito unless she has to because, you know, she's she's just so tender hearted towards animals. But the book does not open with Rachel in, you know, happily roaming the woods with her parents. Instead, she's in a mental hospital and she's been there for 15 years by her own choice because she believes that she is responsible for the terrible shooting accident that took her parents' lives when she was 11. And so in the story, she, she finds out fairly early on in the novel that she couldn't have done this terrible thing. So she goes back to her childhood home to try to get it all figured out. And of course, bad things happen because that's what I write. <laughs> so here's the inspiration for that beautiful log cabin. Um, some of you might know what this is. This is a log cabin near Marquette. It's called Granite Loma, uh, not granite like the rock, but G-R-A-N-O-T, Loma. And it's actually the biggest log cabin in the world. It um, has, you know, these gorgeous rooms. And for anyone who's read The Wicked Sister, you're going to, to clearly see where this is the inspiration for, for some of the details in the hunting lodge particularly this room, right? <laughs> Does that look familiar to anybody? And then um, this stairway in Granite Loma, um, in The Wicked Sister, the stairway that I imagine is grander, but it has, um, it's made of birch logs cut in half, like this stairway, with fairy tale scenes painted on the ends. So, you know, again, you can see where the inspiration comes from. And the fun thing about creating a, a, a setting like this in fiction is I can make it as grand as I want, right? So while while my cabin hunting lodge isn't as big as Granite Loma, I like to think it's it's more beautiful. So that's one source of inspiration. And then the other source of inspiration I've already mentioned, and that is black bears. <laughs> and the reason I wanted black bears to feature largely in the story is because, as I'm sure many know, Black bears are Michigan's largest predator. And, um, but I wanted to depict them in the story as, as a powerful creature, but, you know, a creature to be respected and admired. It, my book was not going to be, you know, a bear raids a campground and starts tearing apart the tents. No, no, nothing like that, you know. So Rachel has this strong connection to bears. I, however, have very little experience with bears. When I lived in the Upper Peninsula, there were a couple of times when I could have seen a black bear if I wanted to. And I chose not to. <laughs> One in particular, um, I was walking down a, an old logging road to where I knew there was an apple orchard and my daughter was on my back, you know, the baby. And I was gonna pick some berries back there. And um, as we're walking along the road, I came upon a pile of bear dung and, you know, it didn't look that fresh. So I thought, eh, I'll keep going. So there was another pile that was a little fresher, another pile that was fresher. Finally, the last pile was practically steaming. And I thought, you know, maybe I don't want to see a bear today. I don't think I'm going to pick my berries after all. <laughs> so I turned around and went back. But again, some may have even been here. I did know that north of Newberry, there was a man, his name is Dean Oswald. And he, had, he runs a rescue facility for bears. This is Dean with one of his bears, which I just think this is the coolest picture ever. So he, he takes in orphan cubs, um, uh, bears that have been like, maybe they were in a little roadside zoo in another state and, and it got closed down for bad conditions. You know, where's the bear gonna go, right? 
So he has this facility, it's a many acres of land. Um, he has huge enclosures, males are in one, females are in another, there's no breeding going on. You know, the yearlings of the, the baby cubs are in another section and then, and then the cubs too. So I, one of the things that I learned from, from Mr. Oswell, because obviously he knows bears really well, um, that I thought was interesting was that a bear digs a den only as large as itself. And if you think about it, it makes sense because, you know, their, their body heat has to heat this space. So why would they be in a cave, you know, with a lot of dead air around them? So, so I thought that was interesting. And he also told me that they go to back to the same den year after year, unless another bear gets there first, which was kind of cool. And I also found out that one of the things they do to feed all these bears, because they have between 50 and 70 bears all the time, um, they collect scraps from all of all of the area schools hospitals restaurants um, meat scraps vegetable scraps because bears are omnivorous and they will eat anything and they put them in in those white paint buckets you white five gallon buckets and they drive into the enclosures on a, on a four-wheeler and you know dump the buckets off and the bears of course know the routine and they come and eat it and I thought it would just be the coolest thing to to go in an enclosure with him, you know, when when they feed the bears, just to ride along. And he said no, he couldn't couldn't let me do that. He had brought a friend of his in once, and the bear like kind of he didn't bite her, attack her, but he he bit down on her arm, you know, and held on to her arm. And so his insurance wouldn't let that happen. But you know, all the while I'm thinking wouldn't that just be the coolest thing ever if you had these scars on your arm and you could say, oh, well, you know, a bear did that. <laughs> so this was as close as I got to the bears and it's probably just as well that there's a double chain link fence between me and the bears. But I also um, did the, the tourist thing with, you know, take your picture with the bear cub for 10 bucks because like, why wouldn't you do that? And there's a trick to how they get the little cubs to pose with a person like me there. I'm going to enlarge this on my screen and maybe you can see. Can you see? I am holding a wooden spoon painted black. <laughs> and on the end of that spoon, there's some jelly for the little cub to eat. <laughs> So that's that's how they uh, how they make that happen for for the uh, tourists. So that's the end of, of me talking about the Wicked Sister in my novels and you know what led me to this day talking to you guys now. So um, Dennis, if you want to open it up to questions at this point, I'll stop my screen share and uh, you know hopefully we can have some some nice conversation here. Oh, I see somebody's got a question about uh, my next book in the chat, um, Clark's. Thanks for asking. I appreciate that because um, I am working on another book and it is also set in the Upper Peninsula. So as far as like what area of the Upper Peninsula, the book takes place in Grand Marais. But you know how in The Marsh King's Daughter, I used the, the marsh or the swamp or the wetland as, as the main setting for the book. And then in The Wicked Sister, I used the forest as the setting for the book. Well, this time I'm using Lake Superior because, you know, Michigan, the Great Lakes, I, I've got to bring that in. And when we lived in the Upper Peninsula, you know, we would often go up to Lake Superior and throw rocks in. And, you know, I've seen the lake in, in many different moods. The section of shoreline between Grand Marais and Whitefish Point, where my story takes place, I discovered is also known as the graveyard of the Great Lakes because so many ships have gone down there, including the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, so that might give a little hint as to some of the story events in the novel that I'm working on now. And, you know, um, I'm fine with people like physically raising your hand if, and I can call on you if I can see you or um, Dennis, you can unmute everybody if you like, however you like to handle the Q and A. Um, you're, you're muted yourself, Dennis. <laughs> so I think I have invited everyone to unmute. So you should be able to unmute yourselves.
Marge Spears. I am wondering about your education. Did you have any training in uh, um, you know, English background or anything like that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was a good student and I, and I won creative writing awards when I was in high school. Um, but I wasn't one of these people that was always compelled to write. And I went to the University of Michigan for one semester, dropped out to marry my artist husband in the early years of our marriage. He made stoneware pottery and we traveled around to art shows and then we ended up moving to the Upper Peninsula and I did other creative things, but I, I didn't write. So, so my formal education kind of stopped, but you know, my life education continued, right? <laughs> and so, um, I came to writing seriously when my son was in high school. We were living in St. Ignace. He's a talented writer. And I was encouraging him to enter the same contest that I had done well in, which is the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. He entered, he won a gold key award. You know, that's the highest level that they give out, but they give many of them, you know, it isn't like just a single winner. So it just happened that the year that he won this gold key award was the contest's 75th anniversary. And the awards ceremony was at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Kathy Bates was the master of ceremonies. Frank McCourt, who wrote Angela's Ashes, was the keynote speaker. And I'm like, we are going. <laughs> and so, you know, being in that environment and, and, you know, that just basically got me thinking, well, what about me? I, I used to be a good writer. So, you know, I started writing short stories. I wrote short stories for about a year just to get the creative juices flowing again. Then I decided I would write a novel. And, you know, here I am 20 years later, still writing seriously. So, so that's, that's, that's my education and writing history, both. Terrific. You are a natural then. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's, it's a combination. It's a combination because nobody automatically knows how to write. I think, I think, you definitely have to be a reader if you're going to be a writer, you know, because yeah. you're absorbing story structure and, and things like that as, as you're, um, you know, as you're reading. And then, you know, the writing, I did not take classes. Um, I just learned by doing. And I do think it's kind of, um, kind of funny now because uh, I'm often uh, teaching MFA students, you know, writing. <laughs> and I was a college dropout. <laughs> and I didn't, get an MFA, but you know, it's one of those things that uh, uh, I guess my, my, the success of my novels is, is my credentials. <laughs> You're definitely an inspiration to young people. Well, thank you. And, and I, I hope like, if there are any writers here, um, I, I always emphasize this when I'm specifically talking to writers, look at the trajectory of my career. You know, there were many times that I thought, oh, um, I'll just quit writing. You know, I've had some mild success, but nothing major. Imagine if I had quit uh, and all that stuff that I showed you, you know, I never would have known what could have been right around the corner for me if I had given up. So for me, that's the big takeaway that from my personal experience, you know, whether, whether a person is involved in a creative endeavor or, or a philanthropy or a business adventure, you know, a, a, adventure <laughs> venture <laughs> um yeah don't don't quit because you know if, obviously if you quit you you won't succeed and you you know and the other thing that i i always emphasize to writers what happened for me was um i changed the kind of books that i wrote right you know i went from science-based thrillers to psychological suspense and I didn't consciously make that change because I woke up in the night with the first sentences of the Marsh King's daughter in my head. And then that just led me in that direction. But I do think that writing this kind of book plays to my writing strengths. It's Marsh King's daughter is a far better book than, than my early novels. And so that's the other thing that I, I like to encourage writers if they've been at it for a while and they're not seeing the success that they want, whether they're looking for a literary agent and they're not getting anywhere, or maybe you're published with a small publisher and you want to break into a bigger publisher. Um, don't be afraid to change up what you're writing because just because you start writing a particular kind of book doesn't mean that that's where your strengths lie. So uh, yeah, be open to, to trying something new. That, those are my two big pieces of advice for writers. So Karen, there is a question in the chat from Greta. 
what is your routine and how long for one book? It takes me roughly, I would say a year and two or three months to write a book. I know some writers are able to, to crank them out and they come out with a book a year. Some write even faster than that. Well, um, I'm, I'm not a fast writer. And part of the problem is me. I'm an, ex, I'm an obsessive compulsive perfectionist. So it's really hard not to just keep tweaking and reworking those, those pages and chapters. You know, it's best to just get the book down and then go back and edit. I know this, but it's so hard to do, you know? <laughs> so there's that. And then um, when I was writing The Wicked Sister, that took me longer because of what I mentioned before, you know, I, I kind of choked over the idea that, you know, I had to repeat the success of, of The Marsh King's Daughter. So because I was so late with The Wicked Sister, I missed my contracted deadline. So if I could have been writing 24 seven, I would have been because <laughs> I always had this hanging over my head. Then and once I'd missed my deadline, it was like, well, I can't go out to dinner with friends. I should be working on my book and like that. So, so now I'm not under contract. Um, I'm writing on my own time. I still have my own goals. Like, you know, I hope to be finished with the book shortly after the first of the year, because it takes a year to go through the publishing process. And I, I don't want to make readers wait as long as they had to for The Wicked Sister. So, uh, but I, I'm a little more free. So I write best early in the morning. I get up five o'clock-ish, something like that, and come out to my beautiful workroom here, <laughs> which used to be our upholstery shop. <laughs> and then, um, I, so my, my best time is, is from early morning till about noon. And then I'll take a little break, answer emails, do other things and come back to it and work a little bit more in the evening. And yeah, it's, it's nice because I write full time now, which a lot of writers can't, you know, they're juggling family, they're juggling jobs, but uh, all I do is write. So yeah, it's pretty nice. Do you uh, lay out a strategy and outline a strategy before you start writing your chapters, like a timeline with different characters and plots? That's a great question. Um, I do outline, but it's a very general, broad outline. So it, it's like um, if you had a roadmap that just showed the major highways and not all the little, you know, little right. side roads that you could take. And I find that that's useful because it keeps me on track. I, I have to have this overarching idea of where the story is going. But at the same time, I want, I, I love that process of discovery as you're writing. So in The Marsh King's Daughter, in my outline, there's no scene at Taquaman Falls. Um, for those who've read the book, you know that that's like a major pivotal scene. So as, as I'm writing, I realized, well, wait a minute. Um, they're, they're two miles upstream from Taquaman Falls. I have to put the falls in the book. And then, you know, it can't be just a... Um, uh, family going on a picnic. There has to be a purpose to the scene, right? And so it grew and grew. And I think it's really cool to, like, for me, one of the most fun things as a writer is when you're three quarters of the way through the book and you have an idea for something you can do and you've already laid the groundwork for it. Mm -hmm. So it's like your subconscious was leading you in this direction and consciously you weren't yet aware of it until you got to that point in the story. And then it was like, aha, mm -hmm. that's where this was going. So yeah, I outline enough that I don't, you know, get lost in the woods, right. <laughs> but I like to have a lot of room for just that process of discovery as, I, as I'm working. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. What about metaphors and who, who are some of your biggest inspirations on um, graphic writing and metaphors and when to use them? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a closet literary fiction writer. I don't claim to be a literary fiction writer, but I love beautiful books. And so for inspiration, every year I read several um, books that have been nominated for major awards, like, you know, the Booker and, and the National Book Award and Pulitzer Prize and so forth. Um, sometimes I can't get through them because <laughs> exactly. I am I am a commercial writer too. But I, I call it reading up in my mind, meaning that I want to read books that are written better than me, than I can, than mine are, than I can write to, to be inspired by them. Okay. And so, um, 
you know, there's a reason that they were nominated for awards. So I want to read them and I want to see what was it about the book that, you know, made it so special. So yeah, I, I love to sneak in, you know, some beautiful sentences here and there. But I'm also inspired by writers like Lee Child. Uh, I've heard him speak a few times, you know, and he says his writing is very square. And it's, it's um, but yet when he, he includes a detail, it's just the right detail. Mm -hmm. And so I like, I like a mix of that. I don't want to get bogged down in the beautiful descriptions. You know, I want to keep the story moving. So I, I try to find that sweet, so, sweet spot in between both of them. Yeah. Thanks, okay, that's thanks. a great question. I, I think Dennis might have had to leave a little uh, for a second. So somebody just speak up and, um, uh, mm -hmm. or wave your hand at me. Yeah. Did you turn up? No, no. Are you done? Oh, Greta, did you have something? I, I saw your uh, screen light up while I was giving an answer. Uh, no, I'm good. I am uh, enjoying your presentation. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. So, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Yay. Uh, That's so, the male version of Greta. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi. So, you know, writing's kind of a solitary sort of uh, endeavor. How do you deal with how solitary it, it is? Um, you know, is it an issue at times? Do you feel isolated? You know, I think, and I, you know, I haven't, this isn't official. I think almost all writers are introverts. Um, I, I am definitely an introvert. And so like an introvert, the, the general description, an extrovert draws energy from other people. An introvert loses energy to other people. <laughs> so I like being alone, you know, too much probably. And um, where I am in my in my office here now, it's it's just my husband and I, and we, um, you know, I don't see him for hours at a time. <laughs> and and it, so it's it's easy for me to be alone. I will say that I love then coming out of my cave and, you know, connecting with people in, in the real world like this because um, it's it's fun, you know, and, and it's, I you know, readers, you're all such smart, you know, well-read, <laughs> incredibly thoughtful people. So I really enjoy talking to people too. But, you know, like as much as I'm enjoying this, when it's done, I'll be like, when I go in the house, I'll say to my husband, don't talk to me. I'm done. I'm done talking for a little while. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I could tell you a little bit more about what the book I'm working on now is, is, is about, if you like. Sure. Yeah, I told you about the setting. So um, the book is tentatively called, the working title is called The Counterfeit Granddaughter. And I, I say, you know, working title because the publisher, they might change it. And besides which counterfeit is, is a long word and so is granddaughter a long word. So I don't know how it would fit across the book. But the reason I'm calling it that is because the main character, she's a young woman who's living in Detroit, a bad neighborhood. She's had a tough upbringing, you know, foster care. Mother was a, a crack addict and so forth. And she makes her living running grandparent scams. Do you, so do you all know what I'm talking about? You know, she calls up older people and uh -huh. pretends to be their granddaughter. Grandma, <laughs> I'm in trouble. I, I, you know, was in a car accident. I need money to fix the car. And, and the grandma goes, Susie, is this Susie? And she's like, yeah, yeah, it's Susie, you know, and, and from there. So that's how she makes her living. And, but the way I get her up to Grand Marais, which is where the story takes place, is um, her, the, the flat where she's been living has, has been uh, destroyed by arson. So she makes one more grandma call uh, for for once in her life, she tells the truth about why she needs money, right? And then the grandma invites her to come and stay with her. And so that gets her up there in, in grammar. But there's a little bit of a twist because the grandma, she might be the counterfeit granddaughter of the story because she claims, and it's never been proven, nobody believes it, but she 100% believes it, that she is the granddaughter of Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> So 
for those of you that know, I mean, obviously Hemingway had a Michigan connection in, in Petoskey and, and Torch Lake area and like that. But yeah. he also went to the Upper Peninsula in 1919 to fish the Fox River. And that was the inspiration for his Nick Adams stories later. So I'm postulating that, you know, in 1919, when he was back from the war, he he hooked up with this grandma's grandma <laughs> and, you know, she's the result. And I, I had a kind of a neat thing happen because I am not a Hemingway scholar. And I was a little concerned, maybe this is a little too far fetched and, you know, I'm trampling in an area where I shouldn't, you know, with this, this I, part of the story. So um, a, a person connected me with a member of the Hemingway Society and he had read The Marsh King's Daughter. So that was, that was cool. So I told him what I was thinking and, and he said, it, it's totally fine. And in fact, he gave me a, a detail. Like he said, when Hemingway came back from the war, he wouldn't fall in love with this woman's gram grandma's grandma because um, he had fallen in love with a nurse in Italy. And so I thought, well, okay, then maybe she lost someone in the war too. And, you know, the night that they hook up, they don't intend to sleep together. You know, they're just, you know, commiserating together on how tough the war was and so forth. So, so you know, it, it's kind of fun that you can can tap into scholars and, you know, get that piece in into the book. So if, if it turns out the way I want, the, the grandma, she's taking too much medication. So she sleeps a lot. And so I want to have italicized scenes as she's sleeping which is her remembering what she's been told about how Hemingway met her grandma and so forth. And so I want to, I want to, you know, make those as if they're really happening. Um, it's going to take a little bit of research and such, but I think that Hemingway piece is going to make the book a lot of fun. Of course, still bad things happen because, you know, yeah. <laughs> because they do. Those right? are my books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds exciting. <laughs> Thank you. And you can probably tell I'm excited about it too, you know, so that's, that's, that's the key thing, you know, and, and that's one of the joys about being a writer too, is you can pick and choose your subjects and you pick something that interests you and excites you and then you write that book. So, you know, it's a lot of fun. I wanted to tell you that we discovered your book uh, on our, we were working on our bucket list to go up to the UP and explore the Pitchard Rocks. And we were camping in Munising and we went into the bookstore coffee shop and that's where we discovered your book. Oh, that's so cool. That coffee shop, I love that. I, I, I stop there every time I pass through and uh, yeah, they're, they're awesome. They have that um, nice little display of my books all the time. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. Thank you, it's fun to know. I did have a fun experience while I was there. I was doing what's called a table signing, which is, it's not advertised in the paper or anything. I'm just there at a set time. So when I arrived, there was some young people who were waiting for me to come. It turns out that they had traveled from North Carolina. The one young man had bought a book for the trip. He had bought the Marsh King's Daughter for the trip to read on the trip. They'd stopped at that bookstore in Munising to just get a coffee and found out I was going to be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so it's like, all right, here's the author of the book you're reading on your trip. <laughs> that was really fun. Very, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I've had so many nice experiences on the road. It's, it's been just a real privilege to do, do that kind of thing. So Karen, I'm curious about, so, so the, the house that you and your husband built, mm -hmm. you showed us a couple of different pictures and different stages of, do, do you still own that house? Do you? No, we, we ended up selling it after I would say about four years. And what happened to our family grew and my husband got a job in Newberry, which was 20 odd miles away. And it just wasn't practical to keep keep living there you know so it was a fun little interlude in our life um uh i i so we were like without running water for i don't know two or three years something like that so like in the marsh king's daughter when helena imagines what it was like for her mother to take care of her when she was a baby including washing her diapers by hand in a bucket let's just say i didn't have to imagine that part <laughs> i've been there i've done that and it's every bit as nasty as it sounds <laughs> 
I got another question for you, please. Sure. Do you use a certain publishing platform or do you use Word document? How do you start your books? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I write using Word because that's what that's. I used to be word perfect, but um, most publishers, they want everything submitted in word. So, you know, I write in word, but when I was writing that television tie-in novel that I showed you at the beginning, um, that process, I, I, I made a discovery that if I write my first drafts by hand, it's much faster for me. And the reason that happened was um, for one thing, I only had three months to write that book when I when I contracted to write it. I didn't know if I could write a book that fast. Turns out I can't. But um, <laughs> so um, and then it got delayed because the show was canceled and brought back and canceled and brought back. And so the window that I thought I would write the book in, that's not when it happened. So I had to write the book. And I also, it was at the same time that I was flying to Boston because my oldest daughter was getting married. My laptop was too big to use on the plane. I had to be writing every second I could. So I bought some notepads and I thought, well, at least if I get something down, that's, that's progress, right? I discovered that my productivity is through the roof when I write by hand. And I think it's interesting because my handwriting is terrible. I have to, I have to consciously slow down. I, I'm not exaggerating if I'm going to read it again mm-hmm. later. But I've learned like when you r- write on a computer, for instance, if you make a typo and you see it, you stop and correct it because, well, why wouldn't you? You know, it has to be corrected at some point and it's there in your face. And so that that those interruptions, you know, slow things down. And also for me, um, my mind thinks fast. So, you know, I'll start, let's say, a paragraph and I'll start with, with a beautiful first sentence and maybe the next two or three sentences are good. And then I just want to quickly get it down, you know, because I've, I'm starting to think too fast. So then I go, I go back and read those beautiful sentences again and admire them. And then I tweak a few words and so forth. And so there were a lot of regressions when I work on the screen. So when I'm writing by hand, I don't make typos. (laughs) Um, I might cross out a word, but because I'm giving more thought to it before I put it on the page, the words are better. And, and so they don't need as much work afterwards. I ended up writing that novel in just nine weeks time, which was like insane. (laughs) But, um, and my agent keeps holding that over my head saying, you know, you can write a book in nine weeks. And I'm like, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) it about killed me. I wrote 3000 words the morning of my daughter's wedding, (laughs) but but my productivity went from 2,500 words a week to three to 5,000 words a day. I mean, it was just, it was just crazy more productive. So um, that's what I do is I write the first draft by hand now. And I like, still like to see progress. So when I've written a chapter by hand, I'll type it into the computer, give it a very light edit, but then I go back and, and write that next chapter by hand. And that, that works really well for me. Thank you. Everybody, you know, has to discover their own process. Are you a writer and an aspiring you know, writer? I'm starting to play with it and I'm intrigued with it. Uh, my handwriting is horrific. So <laughs> sometimes I will write stuff with, with a pen, but I'm so much quicker on a computer keyboard. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I can always go back. I can get it down quick enough that I don't think. That's good. I, I don't think I'm as hindered with the computer as with the interruptions that you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. that's good that's good yeah how did you learn about who to contact about publishing how did you find that out yeah I've been with my literary agent for um almost 22 years so back when I was querying and looking for a literary agent you sent letters by by snail mail (laughs) now you know you do electronic queries and the, the process has changed a bit because everything is electronic i The best resource is a website called agentquery.com. You know, the two words together, agentquery.com. They have um, sample query letters and and sample synopsis, and they have a database of agents that you can search by project interest. So, you know, depending on what you've written, you can try to find an agent who who matches that. And they also have discussion forums. I've never participated in them, but um, it's kind of like one-stop shopping. You, you'll learn everything about the process right there. Thank you. Because, 
there are a lot of people who are, who are taking advantage of aspiring writers. You know, they just take they take your money and run more or less. You know, and um, there's there's a lot to watch out for. So um, this website agent query will give you the give you the lowdown. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. And the other thing to keep in mind is is there's all different kinds of writing. So um, the kind of writing that I do is very commercial. So the book was suitable to be um you know brought out by a major publisher but some books are regional in nature and so you know might get a university press like wayne state university press to to publish to you you know and a lot of the michigan notable books um are published by a university press because they have just a narrower than than a, a whole nationwide uh appeal and poetry uh <laughs> not many people are are making money at poetry but you know props to them for writing it because I can't. So, you know, it just depends too on what you're writing. Well, folks are asking really good questions. Oh, I should look. No, no, I mean, they're oh, 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 yeah. in the chat. I mean, just I think here in so. person, people are asking, I'm very impressed. People are asking really good questions. Yeah, for sure. We're, we're going to leave. Thank you very much. It was oh, great to meet you. you. Yes, I uh, appreciate your questions, Greta, and, and the other half. <laughs> I yeah, look forward for to your next book. Bye-bye. Thank you. So I was I was curious. Has everyone read the Wicked Sister? We could we could talk specifically about that if you have, but I don't want to give it away spoilers, you know. But I'm I'm happy to answer questions specific to the book and we'll dance around the the spoiler aspect <laughs> i just found out about this workshop today so okay <laughs> i need to read your books i'm excited to get my hands on them well thank you thank you well i certainly have no objection to you talking you so well okay i i can you know this is something that i haven't touched on so um people have wondered like what, i showed you places and things like the house and the bears but there there were two main things at the heart of the wicked sister um you know we have the character rachel who believes that she shot her parents and then um the story is told in a dual timeline so there's the story of jenny rachel's mother and um the difficulties raising a child who has um well, there is no big secret, psychopathic tendencies. Uh, obviously, Rachel has a sister because the book is called The Wicked Sister. Yeah. So um, for me, like I, I like to write stories that are about a person who has overcome a less than perfect childhood to make something out of themselves. That's, that's a theme through both of my books so far, and it will carry through in, into the one I'm working on now. So, you know, Rachel has this terrible tragedy when she's 11, she thinks she's responsible. And that part of the story was inspired uh, a lot of years ago, I read a news item and it just stuck with me. Uh, there are so many accidental shootings, obviously, and, and done by children and it's usually a family member or a close friend is the victim. In this case, uh, a little boy, a toddler really, was strapped into his car seat in the back seat of the car and he found a loaded handgun in his mother's purse and he shot and killed her, you know, through the seat. And obviously that's so horrific, but it, it made me wonder, well, what's going to happen to that little boy when he grows up? At some point, he's going to find out what he did because, you know, you can't keep it hidden. So, you know, it, whether he's a teenager or, or you know, a, a young adult, uh, and how would that change you? I wondered, you know, because you grow up thinking, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm a good person. And then you find out you did this terrible, terrible thing, you know, when you were little. So, so that was the sort of thing that I wanted to, I wanted to explore that situation for the character of Rachel. What would the effect be on you of, of this sort of thing? And then um, in the case of Jenny with the, the difficult child, um, again, this is a personal experience this time some years ago a friends of the our my husband and i friends they adopted three siblings 
and obviously the children had issues and came from a not so good environment or they wouldn't have been available for adoption. So the two younger children did really well in the new environment, but the older child just became more and more difficult as the years went by. He became violent towards the younger children and they couldn't control him. And so when he was 12, they had to put him in an institution. And again, you know, it just tears your heart out because you think as a parent, how do you reach that moment when you make the decision, you know, that you're going to send one child away for the sake of the other two? It's almost like a Sophie's choice kind of a decision, right? You know, and so that's what Jenny is dealing with. You know, she's, she's got this child. She's been difficult from the time she's a baby. It, it grows, it, it escalates through the course of the story. But at what point this, and this is just the question that I raise because authors don't always give the answers, right? You know, at what point does she say, enough you know this th we have to send this child that we love you know away so um those are the two things that are are at the core of the wicked sister and interestingly as i was struggling to write the book i was only writing rachel's half of the story and it just seemed the story seemed too thin it didn't seem like there was enough there to, to make the kind of book that i wanted to put my name to and when i decided to write her mother's half of the story, basically the events that lead up to this, you know, tragic accident. Then, then the book started coming together for me. I, I, I started loving the book. And in fact, I loved writing the chapters set in the past so much from the mother's perspective that I forgot they were set in the past. Because so, it felt, <laughs> you know, and so <clears throat> when my editor edited it, you know, I, I had them using a cell phone. Well, you know, in the era that I was writing it, there wouldn't have been cell phones available then. So I had to go back and, and change all the references to make sure it was okay for like, you know, the whatever it is, like late eighties, early nineties. So I thought that was fun, kind of funny as I, I just connected so much with her as a mother and her choices that she had to make that I forgot it was supposed to be set in the past. <laughs> Questions. Any other questions for Karen? This has been quite lovely just to have this chat with you. It's really been nice. Well, thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed it, you know, and um, I hope aspiring writers were inspired by it. And, uh, you know, it's just really, really been lovely to talk to you all tonight. So I thank you for spending time with me and inviting me into your home. Thank yes. you so much. Yeah. It's been our pleasure. I think I can speak for all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, I do want to make one little plug before I go. Yeah. <laughs> so sure. um, um, I have one of my, my COVID projects, if you want to call it that, is uh, I've started a new online author series. And the reason I, I partnered with Hank Philippi Ryan, um, she writes thrillers as well, and she's won awards and so forth you might you might read her um, because we did an event together at a bookstore and the usual format when an author does a bookstore event is it's just like it would have be ju been just me and Dennis on the screen and you know I wouldn't see anybody else and that's hard for a writer because when you don't see your audience it's hard to connect with them it's hard to know if you're engaging with them you know there's this back and forth when you're speaking to a live audience so Hank and I decided that we could do something with Zoom that hadn't, hasn't been done before. So what we do, well, the website is called The Back Room. And um, we're in the process of changing the URL to The Back Room with hyphens between it, but it won't be live till the end of the week. For right now, it's bksp.org, bksp.org. And so, what we do is we have a panel of four authors and we have a very short introduction and we make it fun, like with a game of 20 questions, you know, where you just see the authors on the screen. But then after like 15 minutes or so, uh, the audience is broken out into Zoom breakout rooms, four breakout rooms. And so attendees spend the evening in the same breakout room and there might be 15 to 20 people just like we have now in the breakout room. 
your your screens are you know your video is visible your mics are unmuted and the authors visit each room in turn so every 15 minutes you get a new author and you can you know chat with them like this face to face authors are loving it because you know again they can talk to their audience and and readers are really enjoying it too so We've got just an amazing lineup of, of speakers. If you go to the website, you can see the events are free because, you know, we're not going to charge. <laughs> and we wanted, we wanted originally to make the price of admission that you had to show a receipt from a purchase from an independent bookstore because independent bookstores, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, you know, they've, they've had it really tough. But then we realized that that would cut out people who can't afford to buy books, you know, because people have lost their jobs in, in, in the shutdowns in the pandemic too. So we dropped that part, but we do still really, really, really plug independent bookstores. So that's what I wanted to do in my closing words. If you have the means to buy books, please, you know, skip the Amazon and go to the independent bookstores. If you don't know where one is near you, you can go to a website called indiebound.org and put in your zip code and you can find a, a, a bookstore near you. And of course you can, they're all making orders online. So you don't have to even physically go to the bookstore. So if you can possibly, possibly buy a book from an independent bookstore instead of the big box, you'll be, you'll be helping your, your writers, your neighbors and keeping the industry alive. So thanks. So or you can check it out from the library. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we certainly can, can handle those kinds of requests too. Absolutely.